Welcome back to another point of order on the cross-border interviews with Christopher Brown. I am joined again, as always, our weekly guest who just continuously wants to come back on the show because she loves me and she loves the show and loves you, the audience, and our listeners from coast to coast to coast. Sarah Biggs. Sarah, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for having me again. I know. It feels like we just saw each other literally 24 hours ago, eh? (laughs) So we have a lot to digest over the next hour, 45 minutes, depending on how much we can pack in. But I want to start with the morning after. 24 hours later, we still are digesting the biggest political news that come out of Alberta in some time. That is Jason Kenney resigning as premier after receiving 51.4% of the leadership review vote that uh, was held over the last few months. Sarah, we've had a day to digest this. What's your thoughts on what took place last night? And are you still jaw on the floor like you were yesterday? Well, I feel like this morning is over the walk of shame. Um, The morning after. It's... I had time to think about it, digest it, and really try to figure out what happened. And what happened is exactly what Jason Kenny wanted to happen. So he, you know, he didn't get the results and he seemed genuinely shocked when he was talking. And, you know, a lot of MLAs were shocked as well. But um, today he managed to wiggle his way back in into convincing them that he is the guy that can keep the unity until um you know the exec the executive of the ucp calls uh for a leadership review but there's no so under in their uh, convention or by laws there's no set time there's no defined time so mr kenny could very well leading the ucp into the next 2023 election well, if the board decides that, you know, this is not the right time to trigger a leadership review, and that's what we're dealing with right now, we we got Kennyed. Like, when we say that he's the best organizer in the country, if not, like, in North America, then some, like, today's a perfect example of, you know, how his strategies can work. Well, I'm so glad you brought that up, because the... I, I saw I was watching the coverage as the MLAs were walking into McDougal House this morning while they were getting ready for their caucus meeting. And Jason Kenny was tweeting out a, a picture of him wearing a shirt. I, I apologize. I don't remember what that what it was in remembrance of. But Jason Kenny has be, uh, for some some strange reason, Jason Kenny has been able to a resign as leader make everyone happy, but at the same time stay on as leader during a time where I think most people would look at him and say, okay, it's time to do the graceful thing and just walk away. We saw this in 2019 with Andrew Scheer. Andrew Scheer lost the election. He won the most votes, but he lost the election. The caucus started to revolt because blackface had happened in the 2019 election. He wasn't able to win. And Andrew Shear said, okay, I'm going to leave, but I want to stay on as interim leader until a new leader is chosen. And the Conservatives just flailed around for that time while they were waiting because there was no new fresh voice that the electorate wanted to talk to because it was the same old Andrew Shear party. Is this yeah. what's going to happen here in Alberta? Is Jason Kenney staying on going to even push the divide in the Conservative Party even further. So from the noise I was getting from caucus today and whatnot, there was a lot of divide. Um, so you have the Kenny lawyer, lawyer, lawyer lists. Sorry, it's a hard word for me to pronounce. And then you have... If we were doing uh, this you in know, French, you would be doing like speed laps around me. So Sarah, you're doing perfect. <laughs> so, and then you have... Um, the people like, let's say, the Drew Barnes and Leela here, um, you know, Miss here this morning walked in. She was like, well, I think today's a good day because we're able to show the people who we really are. Didn't work that well. 
Um, well, from the reporting of the Edmonton Journal, I apologize for interrupting. The reporting of the Edmonton Journal, I, I saw that she was considering putting her name in that ring for the interim position of the leadership because she wanted to put her name in and sort of be that transition candidate to be the Dave Hancock to Redford and Prentice. But like you said, wah, 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 we, we now have another X amount of weeks, months, days until the next leader is chosen in a leadership race, or if there is even one, of Jason Kenney. Like Jason Kenney saved himself from Jason Kenney again today. It's like... You know, today I was kind of half joking on Twitter and saying word of the day is performative. That's exactly what we've been seeing in the past 24 hours. Last night was, okay, guys, here's what you wanted. I'm leaving. And then he probably woke up this morning and was like, okay, but no, I'll try to stay on a little longer because no one had his resignation on their bingo card last night no one you know everybody lisa young was redoing her chart last night like everybody was trying to figure it out and you know they delayed that leadership review as much as they could and mr kenny really you know from internal uh, information we're getting he really put a lot of pressure into a vote by mail instead of in person in Red Deer because too many people, we can't handle it. So, you know, that 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 leadership review that was supposed to be so earlier in the year didn't happen until almost six months in when that was voted last November, October, November. And then, you know, and then we got, saw the board that got elected and all that. And, you know, the I have a feeling that the board will be complying with Mr. Kenny's request in the next few months. Because he, I don't know how he did it to convince them today that he was the option. Or maybe he just threatened them with a snap. Who knows? And, and be like, you're all going to lose your seat in 30 days. We don't know what happened in there. I'm sure we're going to be hearing more in the next few days. Um, so, but the one thing that I wanted to talk about tonight, and this is the thing that, or today, if you're listening to this later on, Jason Kenny set up his own demise here, did he not? Because he did not need to call this leadership review. If you remember way back when he called it, he said, I welcome it. Was this just not him setting up his potential doom here? Because I, I appreciate the fact that democracy rules. And you are, um, you want people to vote, but could he have not no. have just said, you know what, I'm going to kick out the people who are pissed off at me, because if you're not behind me, I'd rather see you on the opposite side than stabbing me in the back. No, because the, the leadership review vote was point one the agenda to the UCP convention back last fall. So it was up to the attendance and a member uh, to vote in favor to have a leadership review or to not have a leadership review. And it's that very vote that triggered the process. Then the board took some time. Then they went back and forth. Then they changed the way. Then the venue was canceled. Then they realized that, you know, there was a lot. And then we called for, I remember in, you know, podcast I was on I was like they need to appoint an auditor to make sure if they want to make sure that we're seeing transparency in the process they really need to show um, because right now you know we don't there is so much little faith right now into due process um, so no so then he said yeah but it all shows, shows and we talked about that yesterday how tight his bubble is he is in the very, very tight and small eco chamber. So everything, so he sees what's going on, but everything that is being fed to him is positive. He's, you know, he's doing well. He's the best. Okay, this is the numbers we think. There was 63% that was thrown at us, um, almost from the horse's mouth. And, 
you know, it's, I think it's a mix of his staff is not that great and they're very, very young and do not understand how it can impact leadership or. Well, because I, I appreciate you saying that because I remember 2018 and I think we'll take again, again, I like going back to 2018 here for a few minutes because yeah. we did it last night with Patrick Brown, but I want to do it today with uh, Doug Ford. In 2018, when Doug Ford became premier, he had all these young people around him as well, and his party was nosediving in the polls once he took office. He was appointing the wrong people. He was saying the wrong things. He was not connecting with the people. And Jason Kenney looked like the adult in the room. And when mm-hmm. COVID hit, I think that's when the change happened because the people like Doug Ford became sort of the adult in the room because he kicked out all his people that were causing him harm. He put in adults and he said, okay, let's start talking like the adults in the room as government. And Jason Kenny got, and I, I don't know Brock. I don't know Matt Wolf. So I do not want to throw them under the bus, but you started picking up the people who had ran the Andrew Shear campaign coming out to Alberta and trying to bring the national politics into provincial mm-hmm. politics. And it just didn't work for Jason Kenney. And I think that might've been his first big misstep was he didn't bring the adults in the room who were Albertans, who were truly on the ground, who knew what the people wanted and were just relying on his old staffers from back in Ontario, Ottawa, wasn't he? Well, you know, if we compare Ford to Kenny for a second here, in 2018, Ontario voted for the Ontario PC. Then COVID hit. In 2019, Alberta voted for the ECP and Jason Kenney. What happened when COVID hit is that, um, you know, Ford is a businessman. He's a customer service, sorry. He's a customer service guy and he can read the room. Um, you know, a lot of people were making fun of him when he was uh, shoveling snow inside of the street to try to help someone. But the guy always keeps in mind, and I would say that, well, in appearance, Ford puts his voters first, and Kenny puts his personal interests first. So that's where the there's a big difference between the two guys. Like, Ford's not a politician. Ford was just like, oh, yeah, let's get her done. It's a bucket of beer. Let's go. Um, like, and Kenny's been doing that for 25 years. Well, it's I, I, I'm glad you mentioned 25 years because I, I spoke to someone last night uh, who we're going to be having uh, some comments from hopefully later on tomorrow or this weekend. But yeah, there was no message of established politics is the way that we need to move forward. Doug Ford is a non-politician politician, right? He is not a politician in the name. He is he is a he is a businessman and he's a spokesperson. That's why he, he is can, a man of the people. He yeah. is. He's, I, yeah. Jason Kenney has been around since 1988 or 1998 or whenever he was first 98. You will never see do, okay, Jason Kenney do grandma's cheesecake in your cousin's kitchen back in Ontario. No, exactly. you'll never see that. No, he never tried to be relatable. The last time he tried to be relatable, he got his um, uh, when he has got his uh gas nozzle his, stuck, and gas, gas nozzle stuck exactly. Like, you cannot relate to Jason Kenny. Jason Kenny doesn't have kids, Jason Kenny does not have a spouse, Jason Kenny does not understand and does not understand, you know, the stress that everyday parents can be dealing with you know when it was so frustrating and that's something that Ford should have done better too like I'm gonna give an example the uh child care deal it took so long but I was like why would you say no to a deal that brings in family back in families pockets at least six hundred dollars a month and that they can re-inject into the economy 
that women can go back to work whenever they feel like and they don't have to feel guilty because I know a lot of people, one paycheck is daycare fees and that's it. You know, it's very, very, but that's the thing. There's no, we relate less to Jason Kenny than we can, you know, driving around in the blue truck does not necessarily make you relatable. Um, Ford had more, but it, you know. But it did at first though, let's be honest. It, it connected it with, sweet. because you have to remember we had, the, there was four years of the yeah. NDP at the time. And here's this guy, blue Ford truck. He's driving around, he's connecting. Like I saw Jason Kenny work the room many occasions in Northern Alberta. And he knows he how to it. do that. He knows how to connect. He and yeah. he lost his way, I, do, I think. He lost his way because also the people that he surrounded himself, himself are extremely toxic. Like there is an environment of toxicity in that office that is a lot of people have never seen that before. A lot of people have never experienced that. Um, you know, I'm not going to talk for, you know, the staffers and all that, but it, it, it is a very, very, very different environment. Um, you know, uh, the other day I was at an event and there was not one women staffer in the room. It was all young guys, 20 to 25. Um, you know, there there is a disconnection with what Alberta is and what Alberta should become. And what is our day-to-day -day reality? Because he doesn't see it. Like Doug, Doug Ford's daughter, I'm not going to excuse her or anything, but like she tried to open a shop to sell cookies. You know, like that. she worked at a gym or a tanning salon or like Ford was saying, you know, well, my wife, my daughters, they can't wait to go back in the salon to get their nails done. He was like, I see it. But you couldn't hear something. Like, everybody had a good chuckle. And they were like, well, yeah. okay. You what know, you he, saw from Jason Kenny was, I'm up with Tyler Shandro, Jason Nixon, and Sky Palace drinking around the table doing a work function. And it, yeah. it, Doug Ford knows how to apologize, right? Doug Ford is willing yeah. to say, you know what? I fucked up on this one, guys. I apologize. It's, uh, not, right. it's, it's yeah. not what I wanted to do, but it's what we tried. And I'm not going to be the, I'll be the first to admit I got it wrong sometimes. Jason Kenny, you yeah. never heard the words. I apologize. Like even during the open for summer, not open for summer, he didn't really apologize. He said, we're seeing a spike. And then there was, okay, we shouldn't have introduced the QR codes. It just, there was no actual apology apology, right? Well, because he does not ever, I strongly believe that during the whole process of the COVID management, either your pro restrictions, we were not in lockdowns, Either you're pro restriction or against restrictions. Jason Kenny was not that much inconvenienced. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, you know, when they, they closed school at the last minute on Sunday night, we're like, oh, we got to work. But then we were dealing, like I was uh, working for Crown Corporation back in the day. And um, I was a few weeks pregnant. I was super sick, like not feeling well. I was at home. I was miserable. My husband was working from home. He was working in the living room. I was working in the basement and then tried to, you know, teach a second grader on top of everything. You're like, you're trying to explain to your boss, well, I need a certain amount of time because we cannot leave the kid by themselves, right? There was a lot of things that they were not able to relate and he was not able to relate because he never went through it. Like he doesn't know the difficulty that a lot of women had when they were pregnant, when we, we labored with our masks on, yeah. you know, he, he doesn't understand that. He's never seen like, just for an example, I was hospitalized for almost a week. I was not allowed to have visitors. I was alone. Um, you know, he is not able to relate to everyday Albertan or problems either against restrictions or against pro restrictions. Um, it's, and he did nothing to try to kind of balance everything, be like, I do get it. I really do. Or he could have, you know, make a call to employers to try to 
lower the workload or you know the the i was in financial year end my workload was not decreased even if i had kids at home like there was no there's no sympathy right there was no empathy for the app but and i and i'm gonna say this for jason kenny's sake because i know i i don't want to be the, i don't want it to be the show that attacks someone for their personal no. life Jason Kenny made the choice to not have kids. Jason Kenny made the choice yeah. to not get married. That is his choice. He, he it just it puts you at a disadvantage when you're trying to connect with families who are going through this stuff. Like Sarah said, the schooling, the healthcare issues. Because I can tell you, going into the hospital during the height, the peaks of COVID, during my cancer yeah. treatments, my husband wasn't coming in with me because a he didn't want to get sick, and b we just wanted to like maintain a small amount of people who were getting exposed in the hospital as possible because he had to work. I had to work and it was just a pain in the butt. And I do, I do appreciate that our nurses and our doctors did as best as they could. And when I had my surgery in December, it was hard because I was in the hospital by myself, just there. And you can't imagine how lonely it can feel. And I feel bad for people in long-term care homes who were in yeah. hospital beds more longer than I was, who were just sitting yeah. there waiting and waiting and waiting for Looking out the window. And seeing a nurse come in with a massive mask on, plastic bubble wrapped around them. It is the most uh, atrocious thing. And there was no connection. And, and I don't lay that just on Jason Kenny. I'll be, I'll be upfront no. with that. There's a few other, there are other people that need to go around, but that we're talking about Jason Kenny today. But see, just, I'm just going to give you an example of how, but at the beginning, we, we didn't know what we were. Um, I'm going to share something pretty personal here, but just to put it in context. So when I was 14 weeks pregnant, I was pretty sick. Um, at the beginning, we chose the, the midwife route. Because I was like, well, if COVID gets too bad, I don't want to go to the hospital. If I can give birth at home, I will give birth at home. Um, and then I got extremely sick. I had to go in. Um, we have a kid. The grandparents couldn't watch it because we're all in restrictions. There is no bubble. Um, and they were like, um, so he brought me in. Then they looked at my husband, my stepdaughter, and they're like, you can come in. So you got to go back to your car. And I was in a lot of pain. I was not doing well. I was like 14 weeks pregnant. And then, um, you know, they, they looked for the heartbeat and they couldn't find the heartbeat. So I texted my husband, can't find the heartbeat. But then they jabbed me with morphine and everything else. So I couldn't get up. I, I was totally out. So he had to sit in the car for a half hour, 45 minutes before I could say, we found the heartbeat. We're fine. But he was not even allowed to be in there. And I feel like this government really missed on the connections and on the way, you know, and I'm not trying to bash anyone, but if there would have been a little bit more of humanity in the way they have tried to manage things and, you know, you keep strict measures, but you allow a little bit because when you can find your baby's heartbeat, it's one of the most horrible horrendous feelings in the world you just it's and then you start grieving in your head you're like oh my god that's it it's a miscarriage it's but what i've what i'm trying to say is that to be able to lead the individuals in a population into situations like that you need to have the altruism that is necessary to try to figure out and manage the best way you can. And that's a lack of what we have seen. And I appreciate you sharing that story. It is challenging. And of story. And there are- But she's fine now. Exactly. She's, she's all great. She's all, Beautiful, she's good. chirpy little girl from time to time. I hear stories that you text me at like one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> um, she's Today did yeah. not go, like yesterday didn't go as planned as anyone thought. Today didn't go as planned. Um, no. Last night we expected a new leader today, a new premier today. So, uh, well, a new premier elector, a premier in choice uh, today, but it didn't happen. We. No. You, know what I, do you know what I told myself? Do you know what I told myself this morning? 
when I was thinking about, I was like, how could I not see this coming? Because I'm pretty good at trying to see their next move and, you know, read the room. And I was like, how did I miss this? And I was almost beating myself up today because we got Kenny. <laughs> you know, it's nothing happened to anything we could have put on the table. Nothing Literally, worked. we are in the exact same position we were Monday morning. Yeah. What? Nothing's changed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Business is you. Brock still have his job. Bateman or Bateson, what's his name? Yeah. The Tatch right, the one with the mug. Um, you know, he's still there and business as usual in the business premier's as office. Usual. Nobody. But there was some announcement today, an announcement within an announcement. Uh, Daniel mm -hmm. Smith, former leader of the Wild Rose, former Highwood MLA, former PC MLA in the Great Exodius of 2013, we all or 2014, we all remember those days. Um, yes. Held a press conference at 11 o'clock Mountain Standard Time today, or yesterday, announcing, whenever you're watching this, uh, announcing that, yes, she is in, and she's in to win. She is going to run for the leadership of the Conservative Party, the United Conservative Party of Alberta. She's taking a page out of every potential front runner who has ever announced very first. R announce first, get the momentum behind you. Um, are you shocked? Or let, let's talk about the announcement first. Let's actually talk about the announcement first because as much it was as a very nice, it was a very nice uh, background that she purchased on Etsy for two euros. There, I, I'll give her kudos to that. Kudos to Marcus stuff today for you know <laughs> taking that one out. That was top notch. Am I surprised? No, because her name was circulating. I know that there's a lot of conservatives um, that are you know, pushing for her. But again, we need to put everything back in perspective. What can I use? Okay, so I'm going to make a silly example. I'm going to use a little pockets of COVID tests that I have here. So this is your vertical. You have a box. This is left. This is right. Then you take your box, which is going to be my floss. Top is left. Bottom is right. And then you slide it. So you have different kind of left, different kind of right spectrum you don't go 180 you go like this and then it kind of changes colors here again to get purple a little bit more blue a little bit more red you know like yeah. orange or whatever you want to call it so we need to remember that daniel smith is in the bottom bottom section of the political spectrum of that um, that axis Access, yeah. So, and also uh, what shocked me today is that she was like, well, Kenny needs to apologize to the priest and all this. I was like, I don't know. Like if he apologizes to the priest, that means he needs to go apologize to Kevin J. Johnston. No, those both, you know, all of those are bozo eruptions that happened for the past two years. Like I'm worried. So and that's why I was asking last night, was Jason Kenney conservative enough? Yeah. Because the right spectrum on the axis is a smaller minority. They are extremely vocal and they have taken over the direction the party is taking. So was Jason Kenney too centrist? According to Daniel Smith's speech today yeah absolutely like you should be apologizing to everybody than their cousins why they were rules they did not follow the rules well therefore there are consequences that is you have the freedom of making that choice but there will be consequences like if you decide to you know not pay your property taxes well the city's gonna come after you and be like sorry we need to take your house because you didn't pay your Every action someone makes in society has a consequence. And it's like, it's almost if that concept has totally disappeared on the further right side of the spectrum. And, you know, we're hearing freedom, freedom, freedom. But no, 
don't talk to them about abortion and pro-choice though because the freedom stops there oh we, we will so, talk about a little bit more freedom in the conservative yeah. party later but, on here but i want to know, look, there's, a, there's a lot to unpack there is the one who i i'm surprised i did not hear more from or more about today is brian yeah. jean Brian Jean kind of kept to himself today. He made some comments to the media while going into McDougal House today. But overall, he was very quiet. I'm not sure if that's more of a he sees the writing and he sees that he technically didn't win. He technically did not defeat Brian, uh, Jason Kenney. He, Jason Kenney left on his own dime. Or maybe it's him just letting the others take the limelight for five minutes while he gets ready to announce his leadership bid. But the thing is that we need to remember that, you know, as an elected member of caucus, he had to keep it on the down low if he wanted this, his plan to work. Because I would have not seen something going extremely well for him if he would have come out guns blazing right before walking to mcdougall and be like i'm gonna take him down like we're going that would have not bode well with the rest of caucus i think they oh i would say a lot of them were in, still in chung trying to die just last night and the other part was like let's go let's go you know we're we're doing this today we're doing this and we're know? doing it right now <laughs> but you know if a lot of spectacle would have happened I don't think it would have pulled well. It would have gotten even worse for them. So I, I strongly believe that he was advised to Cut. keep it. Keep it. Well, the only one who did say something of substance besides uh, Alila here talking about uh, saying that she was going to potentially throw her hat in the ring for interim leader is the man on the other side of the aisle, aisle Mr. Drew Barnes, saying... Hey guys, I want back in only under the uh, the assumption that Jason Kenny is no longer a leader. Looks like Drew Barnes is going to be outside looking in for a few more months. If when so now, Jason, if Jason Kenny does leave, what as he expects to, he released the letter saying that he is going to uh, resign once a new leader has been chosen uh, in a leadership election. If he does, uh, when he does leave, does the UCP open up and say, Drew Barnes, we're so sorry we missed you for the last year? Or do they have to keep him on the outside? Because if they bring him in, because we all remembered uh, Drew Barnes is quite a, and I want to say this nicely, a firecracker in conservative politics. He is yeah. someone who will speak his mind and will not uh be upset about speaking his mind so does the ucp open arms that uh man back up because i, I want to go back to, uh, i'm just i just want to finish the statement here for a second yeah if we go back to mike lee if we go back to donna kennedy glands when redford stepped down jim prentice opened armed hey mike from fort mcmurray i know you had a prostitution scandal down in uh wisconsin come back in Donna Kennedy Glanz, I know you said some things about uh, Alison Redford. Come back in. Does that start the unification process around a potential new leader? So the way that I would see that the so uh, right now we need to accept the fact that Kenny is the interim premier. He is the interim well, leader. Technically, he's he's not. He's technically still leader and technically still uh, <laughs> premier. Yeah. the bylaws are just so not written well like guys here's a message for the ucp for next leader your bylaws and your convention needs a little bit more work because it's pretty loose and there's a lot of room for interpretation but what we need to think about is so you know yesterday how we're like well you know if he if he wins you know we've been talking about if he wins this he's going to be cleaning house mm -hmm. so my question is he stayed and he's going to try to keep everybody united. Is he going to try to clean the house? I think we need to keep that as a possibility and a very strong possibility. Just like, you know, if he gets mad and the, the party's imploding, for all we know, he could show up Monday morning at DLG's house 
and be like, I'm calling it. I'm calling an election. It's going down with me. You know? So we need nothing. They will not welcome. I would, if he welcomes back Drew Barnes, I will make a $50 donation to your charity. Oh, thank you. Um, Let's do that. I I I will I will take that bet. Oh, if, if if oh. he I know if he uh, doesn't come back, I will make a fifty dollar charity to your. If he does come back, or sorry, so you're saying if he comes back, he'll donate to me. If he doesn't come back, I'll donate to you because I think he has to. I think Todd Lowen and him have to come back and be the unified party that they are so upset about. There's too many people that walked in today and said, let's get her done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Take a, take a page out of Doug Ford's book. Let's get her done. And you know what? Uh, I know that I think it was Godfrey that called for a secret ballot today to decide. And I don't think it happened. Well, yeah, I would be surprised if if it didn't or if it did. Because People are worried about retaliations. Because and Jason that's Kenny where... Jason knows people, right? Jason Kenny still knows people. And he still technically has control of 51% of the people in the party. You saw that yesterday, 51.4%. While that is a bare majority... That he is he controlled... Majority. Yesterday was under invite only it was like they kept the media so i was texting with a few media members last night they were kept behind a white wall until kenny was showing up because he didn't really wanted to see only a few mlas and only a few ministers were invited that is extremely telling so i'm wondering maybe he's going to try to clean the house just like we predicted if he would have won because at the end of the day, he won. Yeah. At the end of the day, he's still there. Nothing changed. Yeah. Uh, one last uh, topic on this before we go to the federal politics of the day. And that yes. is contenders. Danielle Smith has put her name forward saying she's in. She's in it to win. Jason Kenney is about to lose some cabinet ministers here potentially because there's going to be some who will be wanting to run for that leadership. Will he? Case. What? I heard Taze again. Yeah. So the question is, will he take a page out of the uh, the federal, uh, like the John Cretchen uh, playbook, the Stephen Harper, not Stephen Harper because there was no time, but the Brian Mulroney playbook and say, if you run, you have to resign your cabinet position. Will he do that? Because, Or will he try to give a leg up to his supporters? Let's, let's flip a coin. Don't know. Um, he might. But again, the party's not known for their transparency. True that. Not known for making everything kosher. They're not known, you know, it's not. It, it, it is what it I is, don't right? Think we'll see what happens. It is what it is. So it's the law of the land. So we'll see how the, the law is being laid. And yeah, I, I would say probably not. This is, I'm gonna, I, I, this is my prediction for this upcoming leadership race, if there is one. We're going scorch earth this time. Brian Jean and Jason Kenny and Jeff Calloway played nice last time. They didn't talk, they, they fought each other, but they didn't actually come out. I think this election is going to be more a bloodbath. It's going to be a bigger bloodbath than the federal conservative leadership race that is currently ongoing because, because oh, let, it's uh, mild. It's mild, but at the same, but that's what I mean. It's going to be worse than yeah. what we're seeing federally because we I, see the anger on the stage during the debates. This is populist conservative against populist conservative. Who is the more populist in the group, and who is the more conservative of? true conservative roots and that's where i think it's going to be a bloodbath and i think you're right I will agree with you. and uh again we need to maybe consider a party fracture if it goes too much on the right because if it goes too much on the right you're losing edmonton and calgary yeah. and you need to win 
the rural of Alberta, you need to win two out of the three areas. Rural, Calgary, and Edmonton. If you win Calgary and Edmonton, you've won. If you win rural in Calgary, you win. So the NDP and the UCP are looking at the math right now, and if there's a split, it's good for the NDP. If there's not, it's bad for the NDP. <laughs> but so, again, not that... For me? It's not that bad for the NDP right now. Well, 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 it's not. Let, let's talk about that for a second, because she ha Rachel Notley held a press conference today, and I can't yeah, tell you, she I, did. I can't tell you what she told told the people of Alberta. We're here... We're here to win 2023. That's not the message that you want to be talking about right now, is it? Like you said last night, I'm going to quote you here. I just, not quote you, but I'm going to paraphrase what you said last night. You need policy. You need policy today to start getting people to talk about your party. And mm -hmm. if you're just saying, hey, we're not those guys, are people going to start coming to you? Yeah. You think so? she did good today was a good so what the, the the ndp really needs to do right now is focus on voters right so they were like today they went out as a if an election was held today or in the near future this is who you would get we have this we're focusing on this we have experience in healthcare, renewables um you know she really tried she did not, and Rachel Notley has done a very, very good job into trying to kind of segregate herself from the federal NDP because she's not a conventional NDP. The Alberta, and I'm going to anger so many people on the left right now, but the Alberta NDP is not your regular, normal NDP from... Manitoba, Ontario. If you go talk to Quebec. Andrea Horvath, the leader of the Ontario NDP, and you put them in the same room with Rachel Notley, you would think Rachel Notley was a progressive conservative in Ontario. Yeah, and you take Ms. Notley, you put her in Quebec, and I've said that many times, she's going to be considered like a conservative. Mm -hmm. So I think she's really... The way they tried to deal with the events from last night, I, I think it was well thought out. They put a lot of thought to it for, you know, when I said they need to do 180 and fast, I, I kind of seen this today. She was with her nominated candidates. She was like, this is what he has, municipalities. We have Drew Farrell, um, renewables. We have Salim and Najwan, um, health. We have this person, Acadia. You know, it's like she, it's like if she's put a lot of thought into her nomination process to make sure that everyone is extremely well represented, you know? Um, and, and I think she appealed, she almost appealed, she was not overly partisan. She said, we are going to be here for you, Albertans. We will listen to you. We will fix your and it was not messages like, well, we'll try to balance the budget and we'll try to fix health care. It was like, we will fix health care because there's a lot of conservative out there waiting for a hip replacement. They're not happy about the wait time. It affects their lives. It affects their families. You know, so she really kind of left the partisan messaging on the sign. And she really, she's really, she's kind of doing a little bit like Doug, Doug Ford's doing we will get it done. We will fix it. Yeah. Trust us. We're going to be here for you and not our board. I just hope to God she doesn't use the get her done uh, slogan because if she does, then we we have some issues that we need to talk about branding. Um, I want to turn to I want to turn to federal politics because we were about forty five minutes in and we have two last uh, yeah. conversations. Federal politics earlier this week. Ed Fast, the MP, the finance critic for the Conservative Party of Canada, said that he disagreed with Pierre Polyev, the uh, the uh, one of the candidates in the leadership races, uh, policy around the Bank of Canada and the Bank of Canada governor. Within about 20 minutes of that news article dropping, Ed Fast was out as finance critic 
And Candace Bergen released a statement saying he went on his own dime. He decided to withdraw so he could pay more attention to the conservative leadership race because he was the national chair for uh, John Charest. And then Ed Fast said, no, I basically got told to leave because there's no uh, dissent within the caucus right now. What did you well, make of the biggest news here in, uh, in Ottawa within the Conservative Party? I need to be very careful when I address those issues because I represent an organization that promotes environmental yeah. policies uh, at the federal level. So I, I'm not able to take one side or the other, right? I kind of have to try to remain neutral. Um, so what I'm going to say is this. We are seeing the divide. I've been banging my drum on political divide and fracture for months. Again, at the federal level, we are seeing a fracture between the more reform and the more old fashioned, old faction PCs kind of dividing. If Ed Fast said what you said about the government of Ken and you, you know, firing him and crypto and all that doesn't make sense, it's, it's different. Uh, in lack of better terms, and he's being told to mute himself and to tone it down. So I have two questions. Is it coming from the leader and being like, you know, don't try to call out someone else? Or is it the leader being like, nah, you're not going to be attacking my person? I don't know. And that's that's the question that I've had for the last 24 hours as well is, where is this coming from? Because I don't and I, I don't know the people behind the campaigns and it is what it is. I would assume that this is yeah. more of a okay, if you're in the front bench, you're being you're playing nice to all the candidates because we're all supposed to be kumbaya. But let's be honest. Yeah, but I, see, go ahead. Michelle Rampol right now is not a credit, right? She's not. She's totally removed. She got sidelined. But um she didn't mince her words towards Mr. Poryev, not at all. Uh, what what did she call him this week? She didn't call him anything, but she said that. So for those who don't know, Patrick Brown. Yeah, so Michelle Rempel Gardner is Patrick Brown's uh, co-national campaign chair for his leadership bid, and the Patrick Brown campaign released a email to all party supporters. And in the, in a reply from one of the party supporters, he's uh, the uh, I don't know if it's a he or she, um, the conservative party member who got the email said, "You are not my uh, candidate. I think Adolf Hitler won the war. He had right ideas." I'm paraphrasing. I don't have it in front of me right now. And then he went on to say, "Pierre Polyev for prime minister." So Michelle. Yes did not say anything about Pierre's team, but she had said she had sent this off to the Conservative Party of Canada's uh, review to kick this member out because anyone who holds this view should not be allowed in our party. And I kind of agree with her. And then I read the, everyone reads the comments on people's messages, especially when it's something like that. The negative hate that she got from that tweet you don't air public law you don't air dirty laundry in the public you you do this behind the back the conservative party came out and said we are investigating this we are going to look into this matter and look into this member if we need to kick them out they will i am surprised that this was a shot this was a massive shot because she yeah. blacked out the email address she blacked out the name but she had kept Pierre's name in it. And this is me saying it, not Sarah. So anyone who wants to come at me, come at me, please. But she took a shot at Pierre to this week and it landed because P Pierre's people did not know how to respond to this, except you don't air dirty laundry in the public. And I kind of found that interesting for a campaign that was so on message that they weren't prepared for something like this. They you have to prepare for the, the side missile that's going to come out of nowhere, right? I will have to say that, you know, not all campaigns have a dictionary handy. <laughs> That's true. Hey, and then, well, then earlier this week, we saw that Pierre Polyev went on uh, Jordan Peterson's uh, podcast and said, 
Uh, he, I, I want Pierre to come on the show if he wants to. More than willing, the invitation yeah. is open to all the candidates. We are in negotiation with two of them to show up on the show. So Sarah and I will be sitting down with some of the candidates and we will be asking the hard-hitting questions live probably in June, later the next month. But uh, I want to say that if Pierre wants to come on, open invitation. We've reached out to his media people. We haven't heard anything back yet. Um, but he went on the show and he talked about the Anglo-Saxon uh, language that he speaks when he's at these rallies that he's holding. This pissed off a lot of people on the left, which, understandable, they don't like Pierre to begin with. So you have to choose your words carefully when it comes to how you're speaking on record. And then uh, the day after, Mr. Peterson went after a uh, women, women of color, a curvy women of color, that was uh, on the first page of Sports Illustrated because apparently it does not meet her standards. So until I'm just going to send a message of general interest out there, guys, because Mr. Peterson has a very young male following. My dudes, you need to understand that sometimes the weight that we're carrying, it's because of pregnancy, it's because of medication, it's because we've been working too much, it's because we have to keep our job plus curricular stuff plus we we just don't have time to take care of ourselves so before you start bullying everybody that is like over 125 pounds think about it three times and i, I i'm just gonna add on to this and i know i don't have any skin in the game but i'm gonna say this i know you say that they're trying hard to take it off some women some men find plump sexy so like it to you don't like own. it exactly you don't <laughs> like it don't look at it i don't want to read an article because it's not appealing to me i'm not reading it exactly like, why why do we have to be so polarized about everything that shows how fragile our society is becoming want to know why because we are just a polarized community are you okay? Are you crying? Yeah, I was just looking at the time without my glasses. Oh, Sorry. No worries. Okay. <laughs> I want to turn to the last top. Well, second last topic. I'm going to do a quick fire round for the last topic. But this one is the Ontario election. We are two, yeah. week, two weeks away from the Ontario election. We are going to be doing some coverage next week. We're going to be live on location in some of the ridings across uh, southwestern Ontario. So we're going to be there. Uh, the next time Sarah and I sit down will be election night, probably June 2nd, the Thursday, where we're probably, or the Wednesday, depending on if we're live that day or the Thursday, the June 1st or June 2nd. Are we, are we going to Toronto, Chris? Do you want, let's go to Toronto. Let's try and get to Toronto. Let's do it. Um, but we are going to potentially be, uh, we're going to be, I'm going to be live on election night covering the Ontario elections as they come in. Uh, we might bring some people in and we'll have some comments from, and some, uh, just, uh, uh, candid interviews that we're going to be conducting over the next week um today was a big day in the election earlier this morning and ontario ndp leader uh andrea horvath announced that she had tested positive for covid19 two weeks out before the election mike schreiner the ontario green party announced yesterday he was tested positive for covid19 this is the worst time to not be pulling a Aaron O'Toole uh, from the Aaron O'Toole playbook of setting up a virtual campaign in a hotel room where your candidate can go in and talk. Um, Doug Ford's leading in the polls. What's your thoughts on the what's your final thoughts on the election before we potentially talk uh, next time? Well, the progressives in Ontario have a huge problem. They, they need to do something because if the, not the progressive conservatives, the progressives on yeah, the left, the progressives <laughs> on the spectrum. So yeah. the people are not necessarily voting like, you know, everybody else, but um, if they would get their collective uh, shite together, they would be governing and Doug Ford would be sitting in a position. So Ontario, you have a very, very big problem. Um, but, you know, I've, I've worked on, campaigns during COVID and we got someone elected during COVID and it's hard. And we also need to remember that very often your money is coming in within the last two to three weeks uh, during a campaign. It's extremely hard to manage. It's extremely hard to deal with and the connection is not the same. So we'll see if their communication team is able to turn around and make their magic work. Yeah. 
It's going to be interesting. How's Del Luca doing? Does he have COVID yet? Does Del Luca has COVID yet? They do not. Doug for they have no, well, I shouldn't say that. They have not announced that they have. Uh, on Monday night, they had a leadership debate that we did not cover because we were exhausted from the week before. And this week has been just a fun time as well. But Del Duca, Ford, Schreiner, and Horvath were all on stage with Althea Raj and uh, uh, Steve Pagan from TVO. And only two of them have actually tested positive. So are we potentially going to see the other two? I don't know. Something's weird. So everyone know I attended a conservative leadership last week and there was a lot of freedom in that room. And my dudes, I I, I, I didn't catch COVID. And I've been testing myself, you know, on a regular basis because I have, my daughter is 18 months old. She can't get vaccinated. Uh, my nine years old, uh, my 10 years old now, she's fully vaccinated. I'm triple vax. My husband's triple vax. But I was like, I'm so getting COVID. I was like, I, I'm so getting COVID. It's going to happen. I did not catch COVID. You squeaked I, it by. Good job. I, I'm shocked. So, you know, everybody's going to be like, oh, we got COVID. Doug Ford's like, I'm going to get her done. So we'll see what's going to happen. But Ford's going to go back in because I know some people helping him in the background for policy and he's got good people behind him yeah my last topic i want to talk about here actually i should say this i think it's going to be an interesting last two weeks of the campaign this whole covid19 has thrown a loop into the campaigns and i honestly think that the progressives if they're going to win if they're going to start chipping away from doug ford they need to hit hard on covid because i know there are some conservatives who think this is done and people don't want to talk about it my parents have COVID. I, I'm not sure if I should say that out loud, but they have been suffering uh, because I was supposed to be going back uh, this weekend and staying a few days with them, but that has thrown a wrench into my plans over the next few weeks. So next week, so I'm going to be hoteling it from on Toronto to uh, Ottawa. So while you may think COVID is done, it is coming back. There, We are about to enter a new wave because we've been letting our uh, senses down, but please, please, please take uh, caution. But on the note of taking caution, Quebec, as we were recording this, as of uh, Thursday at about 7.55, Global News just reported that there are two confirmed cases of monkeypox on, in Quebec. Does this now change uh, what COVID means to the world? And are we about to go into a new pandemic of monkeypox? And I don't want to say that out loud because I really hope it doesn't happen. But could it could it potentially change the name of the game when it comes to leadership races and how the healthcare no. system is about to handle? No, because uh, monkeypox, monkeypox. Uh, you know, when you have it, you see it. It's easier to be called on it. Yeah. You know, you can isolate better. You can take different measures. And there are some vaccinations. There are some treatments that are very effective. Um, just like against a chicken pox uh, that can be used. It's not official yet. So uh, disclaimer, I, I trained as a nurse, so I've been keeping an eye on it. I didn't know. I know they had 17 under investigation cases. I was not sure if they had confirmed cases yet. As of um, tonight, but, two confirmed cases in the province of but Quebec. It's not going to change anything. Like we, so COVID is pretty big covid did a lot of damage but chicken why do i keep saying chicken pox the monkey pox. because monkey pox sounds like it's something out of like an anime film like monkey pox <laughs> like it just like i don't know um, i think we need to be careful because we're so exhausted from the past two years and a bit now we're we're tired we're exhausted like I'm the first one to say like I've been a little bit careless in my when I'm alone in my outings I'm like well I don't care anymore I you know if I get it if I get it I'm triple wax I'm somewhat healthy I have an immune condition but I'll be fine um but you know there's people like you that needs to be protected but um I think that we need to be extremely careful and we need to keep in mind that those cases you don't see who has COVID you don't but people that has monkeypox, it's pretty like, like 
monkeypox is not a novel disease. It's been around for a while. It's not a novel coronavirus that we don't know how it mutates the protein spikes. We do not know. Are probably going to be able to come up with a vaccine pretty quick because it's very similar to, you know, chicken pox. <laughs> Camelite so, lotion you know, and that's it. Oatmeal, oatmeal bath. Take a bath with baking soda. I don't want to diminish it, but I don't think we need to It's not on your radar down. of something that's going to affect 2022, do you? Is it? I hope not. I hope you know, not. we got a pretty nice backyard because we've been backyard vacation for the past <laughs> two years, but I, I kind of want to go, you know, well you know, out of the country a little bit. We'll see, but you know, it's like SARS yeah. in 2004. It's well, like a lot a of things. <laughs> um, Sarah, we are out of time. We are at the hour yep. and two minute mark. Thank you so much. Do you have the rapid fire thing? Uh, that was my rapid fire for monkey pox. Oh, I was going to see what okay. you're going to talk about. Unless you want to do a rapid fire. I'll just ask you random questions if you want. Okay. Sure. Okay. Let's Okay, what, what, okay, here we go. Next week, last week of the full campaign, does Doug Ford take yeah. a hit? Is there an October surprise in the Ontario election? No. No. Uh, oh, hold on. There's an article that came out today about Doug Ford giving a big contract for masks to a religious organization that we shall not name because it is extremely contentious. But do I believe it's going to affect him? No, because the progressives don't have their proverbial shit together. Who becomes the new leader of the official opposition, Ontario? Liberals or NDP? Liberals. Do the Greens make any gains? No, Greens are conservatives with power panels, with solar panels. Back in, back in Alberta. What happens next with the leadership race? Do we, how many candidates are you expecting to announce for a potential leadership race? Between five and 10 or less? Less. So you think less than five, okay? And then I want to turn to yeah. Saskatchewan here for a quick second. Jerry Ritz, the former Minister of Agriculture for the Federal Conservative under Stephen Harper, longest serving agriculture minister, announced this week that he is forming a party in provincial politics with a few members of the right of the Saskatchewan party called the United Saskatchewan Party, taking a page yeah. out of Jason Kenney's playbook. Will they be a factor going forward against the, the Saskatchewan party under Scott Moe? God save the queen. <laughs> And with that, my last question to you this is this. Monarchists are coming west tomorrow. They are, well, on Friday, they're up in Yellowknife. Prince Charles, uh, Camilla, uh, Duchess Camilla, I don't know how her proper title is. Is this shoring up support for when he officially becomes king of Canada? I think you should just skip and give it to Will. You heard it here first from the cross-border interviews. Thank you, Sarah, so much for doing this. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Like I said, we will be off all next week because we are back in Ontario. We will be back the following week with some great new episodes. We have some great interviews with a former conservative MP, a former liberal MP. Our entertainment rundown, Sarah and I will be back to chat about the uh, provincial election. And then we might just randomly throw in a provincial election or provincial uh, politics one as well just in case so with that i want to thank everyone for tuning in have yourself an excellent day and remember guys and girls go have a conversation with somebody get out from behind that social media and talk because it does make our society better talk to you later guys